Last time we talked about the Moody diagram and how it allows you to get the friction factor, typically as a function of Reynolds number and relative roughness, and then how to predict head loss. But we need to apply it, and we also need to talk about minor head losses. So there's our diagram. Everybody's getting a copy of it, and uh, you'll be able to use it today. Let's start off with the question that will require your calculator. It'll take a while for you to crunch the numbers, uh, warm up a little bit, a little warm up exercise here. All right, well, um, the Reynolds number is uh, rho v d over mu, true? So I have to calculate the, the velocity. And I'm given the volumetric flow rate. Sometimes you're given the mass flow rate. But you're given the volumetric flow rate. So if I can divide by the area, that would be good. And the area is pi d squared over 4. So typically, calculate the area as a step and then take a look at that number and see if it makes sense. And then once you calculate that area, stick it in to calculate the volumetric flow rate. It's 0.5 meters cubed per 500 liters is a half of a cubic meter, right? Five, that's the ratio. 1,000 liters is a cubic meter. And then we get a velocity. And then we stick that velocity into here. We have the density, the diameter, and the viscosity. And so people got roughly, what'd you get for a number on the Reynolds number? Where do you want to go with all the numbers? What's the area? 0 0.049 meters squared. What's the velocity? 10.2 meters per second. What's the Reynolds number? 166,000. Somewhere around there? What's the closest number? Around 170,000. Two digits, right? So, D. No, D is the diameter. That's why I was asking on your way out the door, like you kind of came to consensus that was a circumference because it said round. So no, no, it's a 25 centimeter round uh, duct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a diameter. That's a diameter. So, yeah, I got really close to 500,000. Oh, no, no. Okay, now that we have the Reynolds number being about 167 or 166,000, uh, what is the friction factor? This is the first time that you would need to use that duct roughness of a half a millimeter. And yes, the diameter is 25 centimeters. That's the diameter. All right, so the, uh, the friction factor is found using the Moody diagram as a function of the Reynolds number and the relative roughness. We already have the Re Reynolds number. Uh, this Reynolds number, because it's on a log scale on the Moody diagram, it's probably best to put it to like two significant digits, 1.7, and then to the power 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 to the 5. See that? So it's around 2 times 10 to the 5. That's the Reynolds number. Because it's on a log scale on the x-axis of the Moody diagram, I prefer to put that Reynolds number that way first so I get in the right area. And now I have to calculate the relative roughness. Um, the epsilon divided by diameter, as long as they're in the same length scale, I could put 0.5 millimeter divided by 250 millimeter or put it as point. 0.05 centimeters divided by 25 centimeters or millimeter over meter, whatever it is, but 1.002. So now let's go to the Moody diagram. So we had about 1.7 times 10 to the 5. There's 2 times 10 to the 5, 1 times 10 to the 5. I'm saying, saying that's about 1.7 times 10 to the 5. So somewhere along that line, and then we have the relative roughness of 0.002, correct? So it's somewhere along this line where they intersect. That's where I want to now read off the friction factor, 
the friction factors between 0.02 and 0.03. I know it's a log scale. It's probably more like 0 0.0 what? 0 0.02 something on the friction factor. Five. There you go. All right. It's, it's definitely not these other ones. We were quibbling. Is it 0 0.024, 0 0.025, 0 0.026? It's 0 0.025. Close. So let's go ahead and grade that. Hey, look at that. That's pretty good. All right. What is the velocity pressure? The velocity, another name for the velocity pressure is the what pressure? Dynamic pressure. For this flow, what is the dynamic pressure? Is the velocity pressure, the dynamic pressure, is that equal to 1 half rho v squared? Yes or no? Yeah. Is that in the form of Bernoulli's equation, the pressure form? Yes. So that we also call that the, like the stagnation, the boost in pressure above the static pressure for the stagnation pressure. Okay. So we have one half. We have 1.2 kilogram per meter cubed. We have the velocity we calculated is a 10.2 meters per second. Is that correct on the velocity? And then that's squared, and then the kilogram meter squared over meter cubed second squared is a Pascal, so the units work out. And what does this work out to be in Pascal? 62 Pascal. Do you agree? Let's take a look at the results. Wow, we're doing good. Can you remember some of these numbers for the next slide? All right, we continue to build. So that's 62 Pascal. The same airflow, the same duct size, the same flow rate, the same roughness. What's the pressure drop in a run of 25 meters? So I have a run of length 25 meters. What's the delta P, the pressure drop or the pressure loss in Pascal? I'll go ahead and start it. How long do you need? I can't believe I didn't, I failed to change that. It's 500 liters per second. That's what it was supposed to be. That's the same flow rate as on the previous slide. All right, well, how do you calculate that pressure loss? You unravel the definition of the friction factor. Uh, friction factor, Reynolds number, that's the Moody diagram. And so you're jumping around getting that friction factor. Once you have the friction factor, you know the length of the pipe, the diameter of the pipe, and you know the velocity pressure, you can calculate the pressure loss. <clears throat> so what did this velocity pressure come in at? Do you remember? 62 Pascal, is that right? It did what was the length? 25 meter. What's the diameter? Okay, 0.25 meter. And what was that friction factor? 0.025? 155. I think I had 154 when I ran it, so I truncated it down to 150. But uh, hey, look at that, 80% of you. That's pretty, that's pretty good. All right, you ready for the last one? What is the pressure drop in the run of 25 meters, same length, same everything? Uh-oh, but look at the units that they want you to describe the pressure drop in. What are the units? Inches of water gauge. That's what it is. Inches of water gauge. They often specify pressure drops in funny units like inches of water gauge. All right, so what you do is you hook up a little manometer and you hook up one side over here, one side over there, and it's air that's in our system. And then somewhere in here you put a, a little dip and there you go. And then in the dip you put in some water because we're interested in water gauge. 
inches of water gauge. Without the thing running, the two have the same level, don't they? But if you start running with the airflow down the tube, going this way, the airflow down the tube, which way will it shift? So it'll shift to the right. This goes down a little bit. And now we have a little difference in the height. And that's how they describe that pressure. Inches of water gauge, the height difference between the two sides in that water manometer. So we recall the pressure loss. We just calculated around 150, I think it's 155, 154 uh, Pascal. And that's equal to rho GH, rho of what? Water, it's water in manometer. G, which gravity? Earth's gravity, not the moon's gravity. Okay, and then the height, that's what you're looking for. So H is equal to 155 newtons per meter squared. That's a Pascal. What's rho G for water? 1,000,981 newtons per meter cubed. It's the weight density of water. Gamma is rho G for water. And so the newtons cancel. And all but one of the meters cancel. So how many meters do you get on this number? If you can run it for me, please. 0 0.6, 1 6 meter. And now I need to convert that, unfortunately, to inches. And I have to recall that 2.54 centimeters is 1 inch. Is that approximately 1 inch, or it's if the inch has be, been redefined in terms of the SI unit length of uh, 25.4 millimeters or 2.54 centimeters. What happens to the H? That's what we solved for. H is equal to pressure divided by rho g. And so what do you get for the height in inches of water? Or if you want, you put 0 0.0254 meters is one inch. Do you agree? So, oh, look at that. Look at 66% of the class is correct. You all act like it's like uh, nobody got it correct. But it, 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 it was a lucky guess. Oh, it was a lucky yes. guess? Come on. No, 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 no. All right. I don't have time for that one or that one. We'll have time for this one, though, okay? We'll have time for this one. Air. It's given of us density and viscosity, and it flows in a 9-centimeter round duct, okay, at a high. So what's the diameter? 9 centimeters. At a high velocity, so that the Reynolds number is very large. The duct roughness is 0 0.09 millimeters. It's galvanized sheet metal, if you can get a round galvanized sheet metal duct. What is the friction factor, F? So we'll give you two minutes on that one. All right, everybody's in. Well, what do we do is we uh, recall that the friction factor is a function of the Reynolds number and the relative roughness. And when the Reynolds number gets very, very high, that's a kind of a key word there, very large Reynolds number for high velocity, it's kind of why I underlined it a little bit. What happens to the friction factor? The friction factor becomes Reynolds number independent, and it's only a function in the limit when it's high, Reynolds number, of relative roughness. So we just calculate the relative roughness. So the relative roughness for this case, anybody? 0 0.001, correct. Then we look at the Moody diagram, and we find where that high turbulent, fully turbulent, complete turbulent zone is. And then we uh, read off a friction factor of about, correct? Look at that. Pretty good, no? All right. 
we've covered the major head losses or the major pressure drops. That friction factor, and then you unravel it to get the pressure loss for the major F L over D times the velocity pressure, dynamic pressure. Now we move into minor losses. What, are, what, are, what, are, what do you mean by minor losses? It's, the easiest one is think about a valve. Somebody has a valve in a pipeline or doesn't have a valve in the pipeline. If you have a valve in a pipeline and it's partially closed, you will get a larger pressure drop because of the presence of the valve and its position partially closed. Then if it was just a straight run without any valve in it, you'd still maybe get a pressure drop. Maybe it's small, maybe you want to neglect it, but you would still get a pressure drop. And the difference between having the pressure drop over the same length with and without the valve, with the valve, without the valve, that's the pressure drop associated with the valve. Okay. So that's the pressure loss associated with the valve. That's a minor loss because it's a part that goes in there. It really doesn't have much length to it. It's pretty compact in the piping system, and you have a pressure drop or a pressure loss associated with that valve. So for a, for a straight run, as a reminder, what's our key equation? It's pretty abstract, but we had the definition of a friction factor. True? What again was the definition of the friction factor? That's plotted on the y-axis of Moody's diagram. Oh, that's laminar 64 over Reynolds number. Yeah, but we don't really have an analytic expression for what it is in the turbulent region unless you look at the Colebrook equation or Holland equation or the Churchill equation, but those are just empirical curve fits. But uh, it would be some uh, head loss D over L divided by one half V squared over G. Something like that. Make sense? So that when you unraveled it, you could get that the head loss is equal to the friction factor times L over D times one half V squared over G. Does that make sense? Professor, I've seen it where that head loss isn't written that way. I didn't leave enough room. Let me scoot this over. They, let me put it that way. They wrote the friction factor as F is equal to P loss D over L one half rho V squared. Right? First time you see it, they say, they must have an error in their definition of the friction factor. No, they're just used to working in pressure instead of head. Hence, you have the equivalent unraveling of that equation. The pressure loss is equal to F L over D one half rho V squared. That's one of the reasons I went through that exercise. You really need to get that down, right? Get the major loss. How do you calculate it? How do you use the Moody diagram? How do you get the friction factor? How do you um, get the relative roughness and the flow rates, et cetera. But now we go to minor losses. Well, we have a loss coefficient. The loss coefficient is equal to some head loss divided by one half V squared over G. And then you could unravel it when you want to predict the head loss. If you knew the loss coefficient, it would be H of L is equal to K times one half V squared over G. True? Professor, is this the same one half V squared over G that appears here and here? They sure do look like it. So if I just have a straight run of two inch pipe, and then uh, next time I have a straight run of two inch pipe, but somewhere in the middle of it, I put it in a ball, a ball valve or some other valve that's an obstruction, it's a res then it has the same V because it's the same diameter for the fitting as well as for the valve, which is a fitting, as well as the straight run of the pipe. It's the same velocity pressure used in those head loss calculations for the straight run as well as for the loss coefficient for the fitting. How about if I don't like to work in head, but I like to work in pressure? Well, loss coefficient is the pressure loss divided by one half rho V squared Hence, the pressure loss in a minor 
fitting is the loss coefficient times one half rho v squared. Yep, they're the same. You see that one half rho v squared, or you see that one half v squared over g. That's your dynamic head or your dynamic pressure, velocity head or velocity pressure. So this brings up uh, a way to calculate the total head loss. So if I want to calculate the total head loss, could I just add up the major part and the minor part, the loss due to the straight runs plus the fittings? Absolutely. That's right. And since this term is the same as that term, can I combine it to just have F L over D plus K times the one half V squared over G? Sure. You sure could. Right? Yeah, for the head loss. And the same equation for the pressure loss. Pressure loss. F L over D plus K times one half rho V squared. Now, now somebody always says, what happens if I have a pipe that starts out big, then I have a reduction, then it's small? Well, then you're going to have to calculate the total head loss from inlet to outlet. You'll have the head loss is going to be the sum over these F, L over Ds for each of the runs times their one half V squared over G for that run plus how many f other fittings do you have in there, loss coefficients, some kj's, one-half v squared over g for, for that uh, lo minor loss. So you just make it more complicated, but get down one straight run and one fitting. And then maybe you put two straight runs with a fitting in between or three straight runs, etc. Okay. You also have the concept of equivalent length. So you take a look at this equation right here. We're familiar with this equation. And then you look at the equation just developed for the minor losses, true? And you just look and you say, they look so similar. This term is the same as that term. So if I could define an equivalent length just equating these two right here. And when you do that, you find that the equivalent length is the loss coefficient times diameter over the friction factor. Make sense? So what you can do is you can then even simplify the equations by having the same if they're, the, if they're in a series, okay, the same friction factor, w then you have the, the actual length plus the equivalent length divided by the diameter, and that's how you can calculate the head loss. If you don't like the equivalent length, you can avoid it for the rest of your life. You just stay with the loss coefficients, minor k's, and use them that way. But you'll see a lot of people like to do comparisons. I like to see how important that one term is, or that one valve is, or when that one fitting is in my network. And so I'll compare it to how many feet or meters of straight run of the pipe it's equivalent to. So we use the modified Bernoulli's equation. So let's have a pipe. It starts maybe here, and it goes, and maybe there's a fitting, and then another fitting, and maybe there's a valve in it, and then it goes over. It, you can kind of start to see how we're going to build this up. And maybe we, we, we have a, a point one and a point two. And we say, okay, if I have no head loss, then I can write the, the original Bernoulli's equation, which is pressure at one plus one half rho V1 squared plus rho GZ1 equal to the pressure at two plus one half rho v2 squared plus rho gz2. But now I can modify that Bernoulli's equation. If I have a pump, I put it over here as a pressure gain into the system. And if I have any losses, what are the losses due to? Friction. Major, minor losses, I'll put them right there as a pressure loss. Now you know how to predict those pressure losses. Tell me how long the runs are. Tell me the diameter. 
Tell me the flow rate through them. Tell me the, if I have a minor fitting, what the loss coefficient is K for this elbow. Tell me what the loss coefficient K is for this valve, and I'll be able to do a very good job of predicting that loss now. Here's a question. A valve causes 2.2 meter head loss when the average velocity for the flow is 4.3, 4, 4, sorry, just 4 meters per second. What is the loss coefficient for the valve? Calculate K. That's what you're, you're asked to calculate. So I'm going to pause, walk around, see how far you get. You calculate K, please. So the equation is uh, head loss equal to K times uh, V squared over 2G. And so you want to go ahead and uh, put uh, K loss is equal to H, um, oops, head loss, H, uh, 2G divided by V squared. True? And if you substitute the numbers, you find that K comes in at 2.7. You chase your SI units, dimensionless, dimensionless. Make sense? All right. Oh, no, I don't want to do this problem, do I? Um, it's a long problem. Bear with me. How about we go to the traditional style of lecturing? I talk, you sleep. I mean, you listen. <laughs> All right? You ready to do that for a little bit? I may need you to do some calculators. So a few people, if they're eager beavers, can be my runners of numbers. So I have water at 5C, so I get the density and the viscosity of water. It flows in an 8 centimeter diameter, 33 meter long pipe at an average velocity of 5.5 meters per second. The piping system involves multiple flow restrictions with a total minor loss coefficient of 2.6. The friction factor is given, so you don't need to look it up on the Moody diagram. The friction factor is 0 0.025. Determine the total head loss for this piping system. Well, the total head loss is going to be the sum of the major plus the minor. And the major is simply the friction factor, L over D, one-half rho V squared. And the minor is going to be K, one-half rho V squared. That's it. So if I want to, I just put the F, L over D plus K times one half rho V squared. It's not what? So, so the friction factor, 0 0.025. What's the length of the run? 33 meters. What's the diameter? 0 0.08. Meters, so all of that is my F L over D. My loss coefficient K was 2.6, and we had the velocity pressure one half, a thousand kilograms per meter cubed, times the speed, 5.5 meters per second, quantity squared. I've run this enough times. I know those units give me Pascal. I usually run this as an intermediate number to look at what is my velocity pressure in Pascal. Then I run it. So let's do this. Somebody give me three numbers. I would like to know this number plus the 2.6. So what's that number right here, this F L over D? That looks like pressure loss. That's not one. Well, okay, uh, head loss. I need to get rid of this row. Yeah, I need over G, thank you. I need to fix that. I need to do that. V squared over G, thank you. V squared over G, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, trying to go too fast. 5.5 meters per second squared divided by 9.81 meters per second squared. True? Okay, now. Yeah. Yeah, V squared divided by G, thank you. All right. Now, what is that F L over D? 10.31. 10 10 okay, 10.31. Now, uh, can somebody run the, uh, this uh, dynamic head or velocity head for me, the 1 half V squared over G? What is that? 1.54. 1. 
five, four, and the units on that are meter, true? Okay. Now what I like to do is I'll take that 10.31 and I'll add it to 2.6, okay? I can do, that's like 12.9, uh, true? And then I'll take the 10.3 and I'll divide it by 12.9 and the 2.6 and divide it by 12.9. And both of these I'll express as fractions. So what is the 10.3 divided by 12.9? 80%. So basically, 80% of the head loss is attributed to the major losses, and 20% is attributed to the minor losses. It just helps me look and evaluate the system, okay? And so then I can make the final computation. H of L is, for the final answer, 19.9. Very good, thank you. So around 20 meters. And 80% of it's due to the straight runs, and 20% of the head loss is due to the fittings. So let's take a look at uh, flow getting into a pipe from a tank. There is some loss associated with getting that flow into a pipe. And, there, and so if you look at it, you have chunks of fluid starting here. And if you follow a streamline, it's going to bend and go in. And if the chunk of fluid starts here, it'll bend and go in. Ch chunk of fluid here, it'll go in. Chunk of fluid here, it won't bend. It'll just go in. The other ones will bend the other way. Which ones are going to bend the most severe? The ones that start near the wall and kind of get to the wall again. And so because of that, they'll get a developed a region in here often where you have separated flow. It's like a little recirculation zone going in a circle. And the effective opening of the pipe because all the flow that actually gets down the pipe goes through this minimum effective opening called the vena contracta is a lot slower you know so what happens is is the flow goes a little faster than it needs to right in this minimum area then it slows down again as it fills up the whole pipe well that flow separation is wasteful it, it it causes a loss, and that loss then can be realized as a lost mechanical energy or a lost velocity head. What happens is, is the flow starts out way out here with no negligible velocity head. It's all just a pressure head, but the pressure head goes down and gets a minimum right at that, that vena contracta, that smallest area. The velocity is highest, hence the uh, velocity head is greatest. But then it spreads back out to fill the pipe. It slows down a little bit, so the velocity head decreases. And that's what then continues down the pipe, this much velocity head. And this is the starting sort of uh, remaining pressure head to go push it down the pipe. Okay, And this is the loss. So this is a funny word, vena contracta. It goes all the way back to the person who basically, Torricelli, who in the 1600s observed this, and so they still use that terminology. So it's a point where the diameter of the stream is least. It's contracted. And the fluid velocity is a maximum. Okay, Is this the same person, Evangelista Tor Torricelli, who was famous for the, I forgot the name of that measurement, the barometer, the barometer. And his name is associated with a tor. 760 tor is atmospheric pressure. Uh, one millimeter of mercury is a tor of pressure. Okay? So that name, Tor Torricelli, if you ever visit Italy, they, they have statues of him, and if he, what he has in his hand is a barometer. Um, you have to Google it. I used to show it, but no time, and I threw a lot of stuff out, other lectures. I, probably I covered it in Thermo 1. That's probably where I cover it. Where in Italy? I don't remember. Milan? I don't, I don't know. Is, is Rome in Italy? You know. Yeah. Here, I'll show you my knowledge of geography. Well, London, it's in... <laughs> is, is Houston in Italy? Uh, I, you know, I have no idea. 
Well, now if you have uh, different types of fittings where the flow you know, gets into the pipe, here is a protrusion coming in. The pipe sticks into the tank a little distance. Or here, it's a nice clean, but it's an abrupt 90 degree fitting there. It's nice and sealed. Or here, what they've done is they've tried to round it. Does that make any difference? In, it really does make a difference. And what you want to do is not necessarily follow the pack of fluid that just goes straight in, the pack of fluid that goes straight in, the pack of fluid that goes straight in. Start with a pack of fluid which might start at the wall. Start at the wall. Start at the wall. And this one will have the easiest sort of, the wall is helping it come in. This one well, it's going to be ab abrupt, and then you'll probably get some recirculation region. This one, really abrupt, a larger loss coefficient. And so the textbook has a table. Uh, that's what I'm looking at, table 8.4. And that loss coefficient for this case would be around 0.8. Don't take that to the bank to three significant digits. This is, this, is, this is fluid mechanics. You know, these loss coefficients depend a lot on if you have it tilted a little bit, how far in, what does the edge and the thickness of the wall look like. But if you wanted a number, run with 0.8. It gets you in the ballpark. This loss coefficient, 0.5. This loss coefficient with a particular radius can be down as low as 0.03. You can really drop that loss coefficient by helping it. What do you want to avoid? separation. If you have flow in a system and then you have it separate off from the boundary of that system, then it has a little recirculation region. It's very destructive to the mechanical energy of the flowing fluid. It, it loses a lot, so you have a high loss coefficient. How about a pipe outlet? Well, there's some confusion about the pipe outlet, but if you just took a streamline and you went out here, what happened to the velocity deep into the fluid? The velocity goes to zero. What happened to the velocity head of one-half V squared over G? Well, it went to zero. It dissipated. All of that was dissipated. So some people will model it as a, a complete loss of one because the kinetic energy is gone. Now, when you have a modified Bernoulli equation, you also have alpha. Remember what that is? Yeah. It's the kinetic energy correction factor. For turbulent flow, alpha is close enough to 1 for us to run with 1. For laminar flow, first of all, for laminar flow, the velocity head is usually negligible because isn't uh, uh, laminar flow often slow flow? Yeah. And hence, that term is usually negligible. So why fight over the coefficient in front of a negligible term? But if you wanted, alpha is 2. The kinetic energy correction factor is 2 for laminar flow. But when it's important, alpha is close to 1. So often we just neglect it. We say it's 1. And so the loss coefficient here is the same as the loss coefficient there. It would this textbook has a little Ill error in the illustration here, at least in this one. In the, in the printed copy of the book, it looks good, but in my copy the, off the internet, it looks bad. Okay, so the, the smoothing or the having a nice contour for the loss coefficient doesn't make a difference on the pipe outlet, does it? Right? All right. Now, you can have a sudden contraction, a sudden expansion. Here is a sudden ex expansion. If you let this D here go off to infinity, well, we're just back to what we had before. We had a pipe entering into a big tank. And that loss coefficient will be alpha, which is 1. But as it's a less, a smaller, what happens if D goes to D? Well, then it's a straight run and there's no loss coefficient. So somewhere it goes between 0 and 1. And usually there's an equation for that or a plot, a plot. So what does this textbook give us for a sudden expansion? It gives us an equation, which is simply Bernoulli's equation. All right, now, what about a sudden contraction? Isn't this the contraction? All right, 
just a minor point. Look at the arrow, the head on that arrow right there. Do you like its direction or do you think you would prefer it to be this way? Doesn't that look a little better? Otherwise, what happens is, think about this. You've got a little chunk of fluid right here, and it's all going this way. Then you've got these chunk of fluids going that way. That's not the way it goes. It's, it's, it, it's going to sweep the fluid in this corner. It's going to sweep it in the clockwise direction. And it's going to sweep the fluid in this upper corner in the counterclockwise direction, isn't it? So... A little thing, hey, if you haven't found errors in textbooks before, well, maybe open the book and look at it. <laughs> You'll find errors, right? There's plenty of errors in textbooks. I know it's very frustrating when you pay a lot of money, but so I point that out to you. That's an error in the textbook. But uh, how do they uh, model this is, again, either an equation or a uh, plot for the loss coefficient. If you want to minimize the loss, try a gradual expansion or a gradual contraction. And note that the loss coefficients are much lower depending on this angle alpha. If that angle alpha opens up, well, forget it. It's back to what you had before. And in real systems, they often have gradual transitions, things to help eliminate flow separation. This is an elbow. There's many 90 degree and 45 degree type elbows. Some of them are long radius. That's the radius right here of radius of curvature. Long radius, so it's smooth. Some of them are shorter radii. Usually it's just long and short or regular radius. Uh, some of them, they have not only do they come in with a particular diameter, they may go out in a smaller diameter. Turn and reduce. Those are more expensive. Um, uh, you could have a 45 degree elbow, you could have a whole turn around, but anyway you get a loss coefficient for a standard elbow is about 0.3. That's a loss coefficient, a standard 90 degree elbow. It also depends on the type of connection. Is it threaded? Is it flanged and bolted? Is it welded? There's a lot of uh, data out there that engineers have to sometimes take into account and look up loss coefficients. Here's one. Often in air systems you'll have a rectangular duct. Maybe that rectangular duct is 10 inch by maybe 16 inch because you need to carry a lot of air but you don't have a lot of headroom so maybe you make it uh, 10 inches tall but 16 inches wide and it carries air. But then you have to go and you have to turn in 90 degrees. Well, they'll miter it, cut it like at an angle, and put it together with another duct that will continue. And so it's turned that 90 degrees. If you look down on it, that's the way it looks. Well, what do you think about the flow in that one? Where is it going to separate? It's going to separate right in here. And it'll be a circulation region. And it may not be very good flow in there either. So. The loss coefficient on a mitered duct like this without any turning veins to help it turn is around 1.1. That's what the textbook uses, so let's go with it. The engineer or the equipment operator sometimes puts in little veins to help it turn. I mean, this is artistic rendition. Some of those veins would be a pack of them. And so they would help it turn, true? If you put in turning veins, the loss coefficient can go down. The book gives a value of 0.2. You might not think, well, what's a big deal? It doesn't look like it's that significant, but it can be. It can be, and if you're really interested in moving as much air in a small area as possible, it's gonna go as fast as you can get it to go without making a lot of noise. And when it goes fast, it can have significant pressure drops because of frictional losses. So you wanna help it help it by uh, putting in turning veins or p uh, making it smooth transitions. Yes, sir? What are the, the square ones called? Like the round ones are elbows, are these square elbows or mitered elbows? Yeah, this would be a mitered 90. Yeah, mitered 90. 90 degree mitered bend, they call it. 
in this textbook. But people out there would say, yeah, I understand a mitered 90. Here's a problem. It has a couple different parts to it, but we have air. It's uh, 600 liters per second. It's in a 30 centimeter by 40 centimeter rectangular duct. The duct has a surface roughness of one millimeter. It's a basically fibrous glass or fiberglass duct board. It's, a lot of homes have this firm uh, duct board. It'll be inch and a half or two inch thick insulation on it and it'll be a little rough on the interior, about one millimeter roughness uh, at the best. <laughs> Calculate the pressure loss in a straight run of 30 meters. Well, the, 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 the pressure loss, okay, that would be P sub L is equal to the friction factor, the length to diameter times the one half rho V squared. Well, what I'd have to do is I'd have to say I have a rectangular duct of 30 by 40. So what's the area of that 30 by 40? 0.3 times 0.4 meters squared. True? And then what I would do is I would say the perimeter, it's 0.3 plus 0.4, that's 0.7 times 2, that gives me the perimeter. So uh, 2 times 0.7 meter. And then I'd get the hydraulic diameter, that four area over perimeter. Somebody want to run that number for me, please? What is the perimeter? What is the area and what is the hydraulic diameter? I need to hurry up. I got some more I need to cover today. And I don't see. What do you have for the, what is it? 3434? 3, 4, 3, 4. 3 meters, very good, hydraulic diameter. Okay, use that hydraulic diameter right there. And we have to then get uh, the velocity, this V right here, that V is equal to the volumetric flow rate divided by the area. So it was a volumetric flow rate 0.6 meters cubed per second divided by the area uh, 0.12 meters squared. So what is that for the velocity? Uh, five? Five meters per second. All right. So we, put, we know that one, the density is given, uh, we have the hydraulic diameter, we need to get the friction factor, true? So what do I need? I need to get the relative roughness. Let's go ahead and get the uh, one millimeter divided by the diameter of uh, 343 millimeters. So what is that? 0 .003, and calculate the Reynolds number, rho, V, uh, D, divided by mu, that's a hydraulic diameter. What's the hydro uh, Reynolds number coming at? 112459, so that's 1 1.1 times 10 to the fifth, true? Moody diagram time, 1.1 times 10 to the fifth for Reynolds number, 0 0.003 for the friction fact, uh, for the relative roughness. Can you give me a uh, friction factor? Roughly, yeah. 0 0.025? Or somebody want to correct on, play with it a little bit? Close enough, 0 0.025. So stick in the 0 0.025 right there and you'll calculate a pressure loss. And the pressure loss will be in units of Pascal. So that's a straight run of 30 meters on this duct. Yeah. 32, 32.8, 33, 33 uh, Pascal. There's no way, if your friction factors only go to two digits, don't get the pressure loss to three, right? Kind of, but anyway, there's a 33 Pascal. 
Now you have a 90 degree mitered bend without turning vanes in the run. Calculate the equivalent length of this minor loss. Well, the loss coefficient for, was for a non-mitered 90, 1.1, true? But they want the equivalent length. Well, basically the length equivalent is equal to the loss coefficient times the hydraulic diameter divided by that friction factor. So 1.1 times the hydraulic diameter, 0.343 meters, divided by 0 0.025. It's equal to what? Around 15 meters. So if you did have to put a, a 90 degree turn in that duct, the total length is still 30 meters, but the effective resistance would be 15 plus 30, 45 meters. So it would add a lot. So calculate the equivalent length with turning vanes. Well, with turning vanes, K drops to 0.2. So the length equivalent is 0.2 times 0.343 meters divided by 0.025. And that's going to drop from 15 meters down quite a bit. 2.7 meters. So it's about three meters. So it's a significant reduction in the effective uh, resistance due to the, having those turning vanes. Well, now let's move to a piping network. Well, the simplest piping network is going to be a series piping network. And then the next one will be a parallel. And then you have combination of parallel and series, and just like electricity that you solved problems in, in uh, electrical networks. Well, what does it mean if it's in series? Well, it goes through here, then through there, then through there. It just goes straight through the whole thing. But the flow is the same throughout. Okay, well, the same here is for a piping network. We're going to use modified Bernoulli equation. I've written that down before. Uh, we could use the head form or the pressure form, either way. Here's a problem to start us off with. We have uh, water at 10 degrees C with this density and viscosity given. It drains from one tank into another through a 22 meter long pipe that is 8 centimeters in diameter. So that's the diameter D and the L uh, uh, 22 meters. It's galvanized iron pipe. What is the roughness for the galvanized iron pipe? Millimeter, that's why I picked it, 0 0.15 millimeter. Where is the Moody diagram in our textbook? Figure A12, my textbook has it on page 952. All right, good question. What is the flow rate? Um, should I consider something like this? A loss right in here? Sure. Let's go ahead and consider that loss. Should I consider the friction loss in a straight rod? Sure. Let's do that. So we'll use modified Bernoulli equation. So probably start right here with point one and go, 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 go. Now, you can end point two there, or maybe you want to put point two down here. What do you think? Where would, or maybe you want to put point two down here. Where, where would you like to put point two? A little uh, experience solving these problems helps, but when it breaks up into air, it has a lot of friction. And then it's just going to be splashing onto the tank. And it really doesn't matter if the tank is here or here, does it? Will it affect the flow rate that's the, you know, making it into the tank? No. And so don't put two down at the surface of the tank that you're filling when it's, it's being thrown out into the air and now it's just falling and splashing into the tank, okay? So stop two at the exit of the pipe. Look at pressure one plus alpha one, one half rho V one squared plus Rho G Z1, there's no pump to ha add pressure, no pressure gain. I'll put pressure gain and then we'll strike it. Equal to the pressure at 2, P1 
plus alpha 2 1 half rho V2 squared plus rho GZ2 plus pressure losses everywhere between 1 and 2. Okay, um, why is the pressure at 1 equal to pressure at 2? They're both atmospheric. Okay, what about the velocity at 1? Why is that negligible and the kinetic energy at 1 negligible? Large, large diameter tank, and we're not given that. Mm. All right. How about uh, this um, alpha 2? What do you think that's going to be? The kinetic energy correction factor at the exit. Of, I suspect it's close to 1. If it's laminar flow, it's 2. But let's just put it at 1. All right? Make sense? All right. Now, what about... Uh, pressure gain, we have no pumps, no pressure gain, but we have losses. Rewrite this equation. We're going to put the benchmark right here. This is Z2, this is Z1. All right, so what we'll have is we'll have a uh, rho G Z1 minus Z2. That's what drives the flow, the elevation change. And that's what makes it come out fast, as well as overcome the losses. So it's like everything on the left at equal sign drives the flow, and it makes it come out fast. And if there were no losses, it would make it come out the fastest it could come out. And that reminds me of somebody's Torricelli equation to get the exit speed out, the maximum exit speed out of a hole of a side of a tank. Isn't that equal to the square root of 2GH, a height difference? We've seen that before. But with the pressure losses, it's not going to come out as fast. V is not going to be the maximum because of the pressure losses. How do I model those pressure losses? Well, we're going to have a loss coefficient for the entrance. And that will multiply the one half V, uh, one half rho V in the pipe squared. Well, is that the same one half rho V squared? Is that the same one half rho V squared? Are they the same? They are the same. They are the same. That's helpful. Okay, okay. Uh, then we're going to have also plus the pressure drop in the, the straight run pipe of the pipe, the 22 meters. Isn't that friction factor? L over D, 1 half rho V squared. Is that V2? Is that the same 1 half rho V squared? Is, is this the same? Is this the same? Is that? Isn't that all the same? And now, because we're using modified Bernoulli, there's a little bit of confusion. You don't have to have an exit loss coefficient because that exit loss coefficient would have been alpha. And guess what? That's right here. It's, it, it's, it's accounted for. It's like this is the loss uh, due to the exit. It's coming out at that speed. And eventually, all of that kinetic energy, that 1 half rho V squared that it comes out at, is dissipated. So we just have one minor loss due to coming into the pipe entrance region and one major loss due to the straight run it's not much simpler than that does that make sense so if you do this you say okay you're going to have one plus k loss on the entrance plus f l over d times one half rho v two squared some people, again, I'll just, I don't recommend it. They'll say that one is a K loss for the exit. I don't recommend that. You don't need it. Okay? Make sense? All right, let's get rid of that. Did you have a question? Where did the what come from? This is a loss coefficient due to the entrance into the pipe. And we had that Ventura contracta, vena contracta. It's a, uh, 
If you have it well rounded on the inlet, it's a lower loss coefficient. Here we'll do a sharp edged uh, entrance. What was the value of K for that sharp edged? 0 0.5, was it not? Was it not 0 0.5 for the loss coefficient, sharp edge entrance to pipe? Hey, don't fall asleep on me. All right, then we're going to have to do FL over D. True? All right. Um, uh, what is, let's try and do it over here. Uh, what is the, the Reynolds number? Well, we don't know the Reynolds number, do we? If I knew the Reynolds number, I, well, first of all, if I knew the velocity, then I'd be able to know the Reynolds number. So what do, you, what do you do in these cases? Well, calculate the relative roughness of the pipe. What is it? It's 0.15 millimeter divided by 80 millimeters. So what's that relative roughness? Uh, 0 0.0. 0 0.0019, 0 0.002, close enough. I look on the Moody diagram, 0 0.002, is that this one right here? All right, can you tell me what is the minimum roughness I would expect, I mean the minimum friction factor for this pipe flow? I would expect it never to be below about this, right? I'd expect it to never be below that, and I would expect it to never really be above this. The friction factor is between 0.03 and 0.05. It's, you're going to have to iterate if you want a better number, okay? Uh, what number do you want to grab? 0.04? Let's just grab 0.04 and use it. So... Oops, I got plenty of these. So the friction factor estimated is around 0.04. Let's compute this FL over D. That's uh, 0.04 times the length, 22 meters, times the diameter, 0.8 meters. So what do you get for that? No, it's not 0.8, it's 0.08, isn't it? You get 11? Guess what? It's going to be really important. I can tell that friction factor is going to be really important because which one of these dominates this sum? The major loss, the FL over D, the minor loss, the K, or the, the speed at which it goes out, the 1? It's the 11. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, we add these. These are all the same one half rho v squareds. We can add those together. And so the coefficient in front, the one here, the loss coefficient to FL over D. So my question is, you start off with rho v squared factor of k equals rho, k equals rho, or is it kinetic rho v Uh, are you asking me, because I'm not understanding the question, are you asking me how did I get this term, the pressure loss, expressed as two coefficients, one for minor, one for major? Is that it? That it? That's it? Okay. Yeah, the minor and the major, you express that total pressure loss due to friction as the entrance is a minor loss and the straight run in the pipe is a major loss. And I prefer not those terms, but those are the terms used in all of fluid mechanics. You just have to get used to it, right? You know, if, if somebody decided tomorrow that grass was not to be called grass anymore, but we're going to call it trees, and the tall things out there, that's not trees anymore, that's grass, it would take me a while. But I would get used to it, and I'd be able to speak the new way, and everybody, you know, okay, okay, what we mow in the yard is trees, and then what we grow and prune is grass. 
But uh, so sometimes it's a tongue twister here. But now, so what we have is we have the one half rho v squared, and we have over here that rho g uh, elevation difference z1 minus z2. Okay. Can the rows cancel? Sure. They cancel. Um, but now you can calculate that exit speed. Can somebody calculate that exit speed right here? I'll put the answer. Uh, v is, you, from this equation, we know what g is, 9.81. We know what delta z is. It, it's, it's, uh, don't be fooled by this 13 meters for the height of the tank. We already talked about that. That's irrelevant. Okay? It's not going to fill any faster if the fluid is low in that tank or it's high in that tank. What did you calculate for V? 3.96 meters per second. Some, somebody confirm that? Yes. Oh, good. Now, now that if I have that V, guess what I can do to get a better F, a better friction factor? Well, I can use that V to calculate the Reynolds number. Can somebody calculate the Reynolds number? We just solved for this V right here. Oh, Z1 is 30 and Z2 is 20. So if you calculate for me, please, a new Reynolds number, that's at rho V D over mu 241. I'm not interested in anything beyond three significant digits. 242, all right. You got it? Okay, good. Confirm that. Thank you. What I would do is I always have trouble with this. So it's 2.4 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3. Four, five. Because Reynolds number on the Moody diagram is log scale. It's log scale. So now I go over to the Moody diagram and I have 10 to the 5. Good. I'm somewhere in that vicinity. Now I have 2.4. Well, here's 1 times 10 to the 5. There's 2 times 10 to the 5. 3 times 10 to the 5. There's around 2.4. I just come up and we were at the same friction factor, 0.002. And right here is my best new estimate, and it looks like it's below. And so what number would you say that is? 0 0.027, 0 0.028? Remember, this is a log scale, so you have to use, it's not going to be super accurate by your eye. 0 0.027, 0 0.028 is going to have the same correctness when I grade exams. All right? So let's now jump back with that new updated value of the friction factor, 0 0.027. Well, that's significantly below the 0 0.04, right? 4. Um, what the, how come I came up with 0 0.04? Did I mess that up when I first used it? So now, now we update this number right here with the 0 0.027, you multiply F L over D, 0 0.027 times 22 divided by 0 0.08. What do you get? 0 0.047. No, it can't be that. It's, uh, it's something less than 11, right? 7.4. And now we still have the 1 half V squared, and we have the G Z1 minus Z2. So what we did was we're, 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 we improved that number right there, right? Now you can solve for the new V. What do you get for the new V? Three point or four point? Is it already over four for the velocity? It's probably going to be over four, isn't it? Four point oh seven? Oh, four point seven meters per second. Guess what you do? 
get a new Reynolds number. Now you get a new Reynolds number. It's going to be greater than 242,000. And we're, we're really refining it. We're coming in on it, okay? What do you get for a new Reynolds number? Two eighty six thousand. Let's round it off to three times ten to the five. And you know what? When we jump back to the Moody diagram, three times ten to the five. Right there's three. I come up. Maybe it's getting a little crowded in here. I clean up a little bit. Right there is this point right there. I want to get the friction factor for that point right there. And it looks like it's right there on a line. It's a little hard to read it. But uh, 0.02, this, this line right here is 0.022. Then it looks like 0.02, what is it, 0.024. Then 6 and 8. Um, it looks like it may be a 0 0.024. 0 0.024. Great. Uh, you could see how we shifted a little bit, but not much on that log scale for the Reynolds number. Okay. So with the friction factor of 0 0.024, 22 divided by 0 0.08, what do we pick up for the new FL over D? Six point six, one half V squared, and then you have G, Z1 minus Z2, and we. I'm not going to do it anymore. You're not going to do it anymore. But what do you pick up for that new final V then? 4.9 meters per second. So we started with around 4, 4.7. Now we're at 4.9 meters per second. Done. <laughs> we did three iterations, OK? No, there's three iterations to improve because uh, friction factor is a function of the velocity through the Reynolds number. So that's why we had to iterate. In a computer program, it's easy. By hand, it's a pain. But now with that, we can look back at our original question. It says, determine the water flow rate. OK, we have the water speed. And so the volumetric flow rate, AV, is equal to pi times d squared, 0 0.08 meters squared. Isn't it an 8 centimeter pipe over 4? times 4.9 meters per second. So the volumetric flow rate, 0 0.0246 meters cubed per second, or 25, I would put it at 25 liters per second, something like that. You want to put liters per minute. You want to cube cubic meters per minute. You can change it up, but there you go. I would, I would round that off. There's no way to, OK? Did that help? All right. Guess what you do? You then solve different problems. Here's a question. Uh, instead of a four, uh, eight centimeter diameter pipe, I put in a four centimeter diameter pipe. It's the same. Everything else is the same, the heights, the length of the pipe, the loss coefficient. Just answer this. Which one's going to have a higher flow rate? Which one's going to fill the tank faster? The top one, the larger diameter. And why? It will have a lower loss due to the FL over D. You can see how that plays out in the equations. All right. 